Hey everyone. So today I wanted to walk through processing a smaller galaxy. I think uh, with galaxy season approaching, it's a good time to take a look at this. But also one of the things I think a lot of us deal with is that sometimes we're, especially in galaxy season, going for targets that are maybe a little bit smaller than what we're used to when we're processing something like a nebula. So to start off with, I wanna show you this image I took last year of the needle galaxy this is by no means an image that i'm super proud of but i'm just using it to show an example of what you're fighting a lot of times so this was extremely cropped in um, against uh, my refractor telescope as you can tell the background is just kind of awful uh you know everything in here is super noisy and pixelated and this is after doing a decent amount of of work to clean it up and I didn't spend a whole lot of time on the target, but you know, I just wanted to be able to get it. And I got it. And so for that point in time in the year, it was it was good to have gotten it. Um, but this year, you know, I've got a little bit different setup, a little bit more skill, and a little bit more time to commit to it. And I wanted to do a little bit better job on the needle galaxy. So, you know, the main things that I start off with when I'm I'm going for looking at the galaxies is one, have I taken an image before? If I have, what didn't work out last time? Right here, you know, I could tell my background processing didn't work out very well. I really didn't get much detail uh, in here, and I really had to stretch the heck out of it in order to, to make it come out at all. Well, I need to make a plan for doing that better. So the first thing is, you know, in order to get a better background, better separation here, not having to stretch it as hard, all of those things get solved by just putting more exposure time on that target in decent conditions, right? So, you know, I shot this over a couple of nights as opposed to just one night. Um, and I also wanted to make sure that I had as, as good a chance as possible of getting a lot of detail. So in this case, I believe I shot this with just red, green, and blue filters. So this year I wanted to add luminance to it because shooting luminance frames can give you more uh, detail at the end of the day. So armed with that plan, I went and took a new set of exposures for this year. And so as I mentioned before, you know, I wanted to put more time in it. Um, I also changed the scope I was using. So I was using a 106 millimeter refractor before. Um, I recently got uh, an eight inch uh, SCT, the, the Celestron Edge HD 800, which I did a video on before. And so using that scope, a much better field of view without having to crop in. So uncropped, you know, beforehand cropped, you know, maybe it was this big in the frame, you know, versus where it is now. So definitely much, much better uh, in that case. So it takes up the frame more nicely, uh, that kind of thing. And then, you know, I just went in and, and put a decent amount of time in. I, I don't remember off the top of my head exactly how many hours, but this was shot over three nights, about 40, 30 or 40 frames. Uh, per channel on the colors and then about twice that on the luminance. So, you know, I right off the bat with just an auto stretch, I'm seeing I'm getting decent separation. This isn't completely lost and faded into the background just by default. So I should be able to work with that uh, pretty well there. Looking to green, same kind of story there. Doesn't look too bad. Looking to red, same kind of story there. In this case, I'm really paying attention to these edges here. Am I getting it all the way out to the edge? And can kind of tell when it stops. This is really the one that kind of fades out the most, but this one looks like, okay, yeah, I can I can see that going out. I should be able to deal with it pretty well. Uh, and then lastly, I took a luminance. And when you take a look at the luminance, I'm just zoomed up here. You know, you can really see how much more, you know, when we talk about things like detail and separation. Now, granted, this is zoomed in. I can do the same zoom on this one here. You know, comparing between the two, you know, yes, I've got detail in here. I've got detail in here. I feel like there, it's got more definition in there than it is on this one. But then also particularly when you hit those edges, you know, the edge just doesn't seem to quite fade out as much here as it does in here. So that luminance is really what's going to help me get better separation in my background. You know, even little things like 
this guy here. It's super faint, almost looks like noise here. In the luminance, you can tell, oh, there's an actual object in there, right? Um, you know, our little, you know, kind of satellite galaxies here are much more defined uh, than they are in just the, uh, the individual color frames. So taking that luminance really will help out uh, in the end to get better detail on what I was looking for. And I can already tell just not processing any further, right? It isn't just a black line like I had in the other one. There is some more detail there. So that's great. So let's go ahead and minimize a lot of these down here. So what is the first step as we go through and process these? Well, really the first step I normally like to do is to try to clean up the uh, stacking artifacts and the uh, any gradients that are left over. So stacking artifacts are like this kind of dark bar at the top here and down there. And that's really just from uh, each image I'm taking is shifted over a little bit as I'm going through to help reduce noise. And that just creates these little ridges that didn't have as much even data in them as you would otherwise. So in this case, I'm just pulling up the History Explorer to walk through what we did here. Uh, the dynamic crop process is the one that I used. And so when you pull up dynamic crop, all of these are from the process area here as you see them. But when I pulled up the dynamic crop, that's what I did. I just drew a box to get rid of, you know, to only include the stuff that wasn't in those edges, and then hit the, the green check mark to apply it from there. And so once that was done, the next step was moving to, so the next step after that, after this is gone there, is that History Explorer tab is really nice if you can just drag that process onto other images. So really, I just went through each one of these and applied, just dragged it onto that same one, and it does the exact same crop. On all three so that'll make sure that all of these are still gonna line up they're still the same pixels everything's still aligned and Bob's your uncle on that so once I've cropped all these in I now want to get these gradients away so if, like if you can tell on this one it's a little bit brighter on this edge than it is down there overall it's pretty flat my, my flat frames did a great job but I do have a little bit of, of you know gradients in there so going back to that History Explorer, what I ran on this one was just an automatic background extractor. So especially a lot of times in um, PixInsight, people will talk a lot about the dynamic background extraction process here, uh, where you're, you're putting sample points and things like that. And it, can, it, it does a great job and is my typical go-to um, for when I'm dealing with especially larger nebulas and stuff like that. But one of the nice things about when you're dealing with these smaller galaxies is that this is a super well-defined structure in here. I don't have a lot of nebulosity going around here that I need to fight or need to try to keep. You know, really I just wanna make sure that that object doesn't get included in the model. So this kind of target is actually a really great option for the automatic background extractor. You know, it, it typically will do a really good job all by itself. So after I ran that process, I can tell things dim out. And that's just because it is lowering the overall pedestal level of, of kind of background that you have in there. But once you auto stretch it, you can see that gradient's pretty much gone. I don't have any kind of weird ghosting or ringing around this, you know. So automatic on automatic settings worked great. So... If it ain't broke, don't, don't fix it or don't try to do anything more complicated. And then essentially that is the same thing that I did for each of these. And you can do it one of two ways. Either you can do it one uh, color channel at a time. You can run that background extraction process. Or you can do it when all three are combined together. Uh, in my case, um, I wanted to do it when all three were combined together. So when I did the channel combination for that, and that's just the channel combination process, uh, all I was doing was coming in and saying, okay, put my red to red, green to green, blue to blue, and run. And this is the output. So you can tell, you know, very teal in this. So blue and green uh, definitely were kind of over represented versus the red in here. Um, 
but don't be discouraged when you see this. This just means your channels aren't balanced yet. Um, if you're doing the auto stretch, you can kind of just uncheck the little chain on screen transfer function, do it again, and then it'll give you a rough balance of those colors. Uh, but if you look, especially in the background, you can see they're not fully even. Like I've got kind of a red or purple patch here. It's maybe a little bit more green in the center, that kind of thing. And that all tells me I still have some gradients to remove. So once again, I ran just the automatic background extraction process on this. So going back to when everything was linked together and I was all blue here, running that automatic background extractor, once again, kind of brought it down, but let's do our auto stretch again. And you can tell things look a lot better here. It's a lot more even. I may not have as, as natural a tone in this. There may still be a little bit of green, but it, it did a good job, uh, especially since we're gonna do our, our color balancing here in a minute. And so the next step after that is doing the background neutralization. So looking at this particular image here, so I did my background neutralization. And really all it comes down to is you make a small preview. Uh, I guess I removed the preview here, but essentially, oops, sorry, do the new preview button. Essentially just pick an area that doesn't have a bunch of stars or nebula in it, draw a small preview, and then that's the one that you're using in here and drag it over. Um, sometimes it's a pretty dramatic change, but a lot of times there's not much to it. So after running background neutralization, until just jumping between the two not much change so you know the background extractor did a pretty good job uh kind of kind of getting it more to a neutral set but this just kind of gives you that little bit extra bit there then the next step is color calibration uh, for this one i wanted to use the photometric color calibration process which is found here and it's a little bit different than the standard color calibration process. On the standard one, it's just assuming the image white balances in a certain kind of way. And so you pick part of your background and you pick the part of the image as, as your, your white you know, reference there and you run it and it does its best to align those color channels. And, and most of the time that's fine. Um, but sometimes, especially if you really want to get your star colors as, as close to possible right as you can get, uh, the photometric color calibration can be really neat because it will it will look at what part of the sky you were looking at, you know, what what size the frame was, and try to figure out you know where where the star colors should match up and that kind of thing. And by aligning that together, you tend to get a little bit more close to full accuracy on that, that color, or at least that's the thought. So to work with this, uh, you know, these first pieces, you know, I pretty much don't change other than the database server. Um, you know, in general, I think it defaults to, uh, to Strasbourg in, in France. Um, that download may be a little slow when it's trying to download its data at the very beginning. So I just pick one of the ones that's closer to me. So Cambridge is, is probably the closest out of all of these. Um, and so just pick that to make the download a little bit quicker. Then you get into some really important information for running that color calibration process. The first one is the actual coordinates of where the image was pointed. Um, so if you have this exactly uh, in your I don't know if it's actually going to pull this from the fits. I tried it on, my, on this one. And it didn't work. Um, but what I do a lot of times, I'll just do search coordinates in which case you can punch in the object name, which is what I did here, hit search, and then it'll show you, oh, this is what I found. And then when you say get, it'll pop it right into the box here for you. Um, I don't mess with these. Um, the next one is the date time. Uh, I typically get this just by hitting the acquire from image button. It just pulls it out of the fits header. Um, most of the time, I don't have to mess with that. Uh, it, it seems to work just fine. What I do need to mess with is the focal length and pixel size. And this is really important. Getting the RA and deck right and that focal length and pixel size close are, are really important to making things work right. So I know I'm using my reducer to get me to about 1600 millimeters of focal length. So I was able to put that in. I got the pixel size off of my camera 
uh, from the, uh, the the you know one of the websites from you know this is the ZWO ASI sixteen hundred so I can always go back to any of the vendors that sell it or the ASI homepage to get it if I don't remember it. But this is these two things are just pieces of info you probably always want to have on you when you're taking your image. It just helps with little processes like this from time to time. Um, so once all that's in. Really, the, the only other things that I'll do is, you know, sometimes you may need to change from triangle to polygon in this plate solving parameters, uh, depending on whether or not it's having trouble. Polygon's a little bit slower than triangle, but tends to be more accurate. Um, but normally I try it with triangle first and nine times out of 10, that works just fine. Uh, and then the rest of this, I don't really mess with. It's just, these are kind of just the defaults, right? So you know, just kind of running it after having filled in these boxes and putting it to here is enough to have it work just fine. And so, you know, running that process got me to this here on the change. Now, just kind of auto stretching it back up, but you can tell a lot more kind of kind of warmer tones now. A lot of that that kind of odd bluish haze went away um, and that was really it goes through and fits these stars for what their color profile should be and you end up with something that has a much more natural white balance here um, so after the color calibration on this one then i'm just going into noise reduction and noise reduction i'm going to do pretty much the same thing on this one that i'm doing on the luminance layer but for the noise reduction, now on this one I should say I'm skipping over any kind of deconvolution because this is my color data. I do not care about fine detail in the color data. Um, when you add a luminance layer in, it will become the detail. Think of it like, say, a comic book drawing where someone is doing the inking of the the drawing and then another person comes in and colors it afterwards as long as you have good solid inking the color doesn't need to do a sharp line anywhere uh, it's the same kind of thing here when you're looking at a luminance layer so on the color data here i'm just going to skip over anything to, to kind of sharpen it up and go straight to my noise reduction process and i've covered this in other videos as well a little bit but typically what i do a lot of other folks um, will create separate masks for their noise reduction and that's all perfectly fine but in my case i'll normally use the linear mask uh, function within the linear transform because it's pretty solid um, so what you do is you turn that on and you click on the preview mask button and then what that does is when you click on the preview it'll show you what the mask looks like and by default it's going to look kind of nuts here and that's because you need to turn off your auto stretch and then once you turn off the auto stretch, you can see I've got this, the checkbox is on to make it an inverted mask, which is what you'll want to run it with. And what you're really trying to do is get the parts of the object that you don't want to touch with noise reduction, your high signal areas, to be black. And so because this is a linear image, if I have it all the way down at one, you can see I've only got a couple of the most saturated stars showing up here. And just kind of sliding through these it will kind of use this its own internal stretch here on that mask to help you find where you need to be and it's a little bit of just kind of trial and error to get it to the set that works the best for you so you can see now okay great i've got quite a few areas that i'm not doing a lot of noise reduction on and that may be exactly what you need for your target if you go too far you'll see i'm getting a lot of this background noise into it and sometimes you may want to have this whole object really solidly not getting hit by by noise uh, noise reduction but let me show you here when i look at this thing in the the auto stretch you can tell even in my highest signal areas coming across here there's still just tons of noise in this image because it's so diffuse and because it was it was kind of so dim so i kind of want to do noise reduction especially on my color data just about everywhere so i'm not really i didn't really go further than the the standard 100 that was in the default there 
for this, just protecting the very, very brightest areas in this and then the stars. Uh, so that's that's pretty much what I ran in there. And then when you're when you're done with it, close up your preview there, turn off the preview mask, and you're ready to run with it masking and doing the noise redu reduction in one pass. So moving from that, ended up doing this. So you know, zooming in a lot here, that's before the noise reduction and then after. So obviously I still got a lot of blotchiness in here. I'm not too worried about it because once again, the, the intensity of that background is going to get helped out a lot by that, that luminance image. Um, so right now it's more just kind of uh, uh, really trying to smooth out the speckles and blow that, you know, as, as other people say, blow the salt and pepper off of the, uh, off of the image there. So you know, that does a pretty good job. I'm not too worried about it being blurry because once then this is just the color that I'm going for here. So after running that noise reduction, you know, then I moved on to actually stretching the color data. So stretching the color data is, you know, kind of a personal preference and, and varies a lot based on your actual target here. But in this case, what I really wanted to do, what I'll typically do with my stretches is I'll select the image and then I'll start playing around in the screen transfer function first. And so by dragging this, as long as I keep that link button on, um, we'll keep everything kind of linked together and I can kind of start playing around with where I would want it to be. Um, one trick to help fight some of the blotchiness here, the the screen transfer function is going to bring your black floor up a little bit. It shouldn't be clipping anything, but like we know with, with any kind of stretching, the difference between where you were in zero um, or one starts to change up. So what I'll do a lot of times is I'll bring the floor all the way back down so that my background is as even and linear as possible. And then I can kind of play around with this to get it at a level that feels like a good starting point. So in my case here, where I wanted to go uh, for the actual stretch here was to this guy. So bringing up, bringing things up, you know, fairly decently, but not over pulling the center here. Remember, once again, this is color data. You know, my, my intensity of where that color is going to be and everything is going to be handled by the luminance image. So this is just all prepping to make sure that my, my color looks pretty good. And so at this point, I'm done with the color data until I'm ready to combine the luminance with it. So I'll go ahead and shrink that back down and we'll hit back over to luminance here. So with luminance, kind of going through um, a lot of the same processes. Let me switch this to luminance. So a lot of the same, same process. So after the, the background extractor, you know, I'm going to do that noise reduction. The difference was is that I did a deconvolution beforehand. Um, now, once again, I am not a deconvolution expert. It's on my list to really, really learn it well. Um, but just to show you uh, one of the reasons why I was doing what I was doing, if you look at my stars here, I am super egg shaped. You know, my stars really aren't very round. Um, I'm still kind of getting my collimation and spacing and everything just right on that new Edge HD with the, uh, the when the focal reducers on. It looks great when I'm just going at f10. So still kind of working out some kinks there. So that's going to cause me some issues on a standard deconvolution process as I'd learned it. So I kind of actually did uh, this parametric PSF where I'm kind of trying to make this look as much like my my star shapes as possible and then went through and did it. And I found that it did actually do an okay job of doing a little bit without breaking anything. You know, if we take a look at this, you know, very zoomed in, you know, going to where it is before deconvolution and then after, if you look at this, especially this center area here, uh, as I, I click back and forth on it, you'll see it kind of just gain a little bit more definition. You know, it's not doing a lot. It's very subtle. Um, 
And from what I've seen, a lot of times that's what you get with deconvolution, but it does help you later on when you are doing things to kind of uh, do HDR compositions and stuff. That little bit of extra definition does pay off. Um, and it's just a little bit sharper. So I did that basic deconvolution there. Um, and then I went through and did the same kind of noise reduction that I did on the color data. Um, I was I left a little bit more of the detail in here, but the same same basic general process. So you know once again before it, very speckly through here that kind of thing, and then running it afterwards to do this. And for you know anyone who's kind of pausing to look at my standard settings. Uh, this is pretty much it. So having these kind of values punched in for each row here, I like to use the linear mask. The 100 default on that is normally pretty good, but I do find sometimes I need to go up to 150 or even 200, depending on how faint my, my target is that I'm trying to mask on. Um, but the goal here is to make sure that you don't have these hard cutoffs on the speckly. Um, you know, if you if you set your mask too low, then what you'll see is that everything still has a lot of noise in it. If you set it too high, then what you might find is that right in the middle of your bright area, you start getting dots of noise that are hitting it pretty hard uh, when you're going in there. And that can sometimes be difficult to deal with. So if you notice here, I've got a little fringe. This is really where my my noise kind of layers kind of change in there's there isn't much it's been smoothed out pretty well um, but every now and again i'll get a lot of dots in the halos that are just driving me nuts and so that normally tells me i just need to play with my mass settings until i get something that looks a little better so after the noise reduction then it's time to stretch this guy i'm doing the same thing that i did before here where i'm going to take this image kind of bring its floor back down Bring it out like this and you can tell already how much brighter this this kind of seemed just dragging these sliders around than the color data did um, but at the end of the day my stretch ended up being about here so you know on the surface looking at this one you know they look pretty similar but i hope that you can tell that 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 cutoff between the light and the dark you know, how much more defined it all is in the luminance, right? Uh, even though, you know, yes, I did some deconvolution, but even without that, it still would just be more defined because the luminance filter lets more light into the sensor than each of those color filters does, which is going to increase your total signal. And the way I shoot my images tends to be take a luminance, then take a red, then take another luminance, then take a green, then take a blue. So each time it rotates through that, I'm getting two luminance for each of the color channels. So I end up getting double the exposure time on the luminance. Uh, and then the color is just used to, once again, just like coloring a comic book page, just to fill the color in. So at this point, they're both stretched. Uh, I've done noise reduction, the initial noise reduction on both. I've done a little deconvolution here to, to kind of get it in, in fighting shape. And so we're ready to, to combine these images. So now we're going to take our color image and we're going to run the LRGB combination process. So coming in here, LRGB combination, was the process that was run here. And the setup for this is super easy. Once you have your luminance file, uh, whatever you name it, you just come in here, pick it from the list. In my case, it was just loom, right? You leave all of these other, the red, green, and blue unchecked because it's gonna be your color image that you're gonna put it on. So you don't need those uh, separated there. Um, then I don't mess the channel weights. The only other part is the transfer function. So if you leave this at the default of 50-50 here, it is going to basically take the color as is and the luminance as is and put them together. If you slide this saturation one down, it's, it's almost a little counterintuitive because it seems like the number's getting lower. But what ends up happening when you do that is the colors end up having more prominence 
when they're brought in with the lightness so that the sharpness is still there from the lightness but this is a good way to get an, an easy saturation boost on your colors as you're bringing them in under that initial combination so a lot of times i'm normally between 0.25 and 0.35 on those unless it's a very colorful subject and if it's a very colorful subject sometimes i'll just leave it at 50 50 and then mess with sat saturation after the fact uh, but just play around with those and see what works good for you when you're doing that and kind of testing it out turn off that chrominance noise reduction because it'll just be faster and then once you've figured out, ooh, I, I like how that, that looks, I think that the color's right on it, then you can click this on and actually run it uh, for real and let it clean up some of the color noise as it goes through it. So these are the settings that I used here. And making that jump, it'll become you know pretty obvious that difference of having a good quality luminance what it makes when combined with the color data. So just jumping to it here, there we go. So that's the color on its own, adding that black and white luminance. So anything that's colorful in here is pulling from this original, original piece, but it's just all the values get shifted up by that luminance layer. So the detail starts coming back in here, the separation's going on, but I still get the really good star color from the other thing and as i was mentioning before about the background you know when i was looking at that before the combination you know it's easy to say okay that background's a little little splotchy here i don't know how much i like it but once you do the lrgb that that splotchiness starts to even out a lot more because i had more exposure time on the subject you know and so it, it tends to look a little bit better off the bat there now it, it still isn't perfect so the next thing that i tend to run on here you can see some speckles in there there's some blotchy in the background the next thing i'm going to do is the tgv denoise noise reduction so in this case looking at it i did not use a mask on this one i know that's kind of a no-no for a lot of other people that use this process uh, for me, I found these particular settings and then playing around with the strength level, how much do I want to apply it, um, tend to work well enough that a lot of times I don't personally feel like I need uh, a lot of masking on, on TGB. So once again, this is one of those things where you run it on a preview because it'll run faster. And then once you've kind of dialed in what you think looks good, you run it, you run it on the whole thing. And so running across that, it's going to be very, very subtle to see, even at this zoom in level. But I'm going to bring it in to here, where you can see I've got a lot of little kind of salt and pepper dots uh, still through here, when it really should be more of a smooth gradient. Um, and so there it is after TGV. So before and then after. And so you can see it just smooths out all of this kind of bumpy gradient part here really really well and then what i'm trying to prevent is losing detail now i am super zoomed in i'm nine one here right so everything's pixelated but you can see i've got a small detail bump there a detail bump there one there and so that's what i'm watching for to make sure i don't completely lose them like these two looking pretty good this one just barely there still and so it's kind of the trade-off of of going back and forth there now granted once you move out to one to one you know i know you can't tell on youtube because i can't even tell on my monitor the difference here this is all this isn't in service to you know a final image sitting on an iPad at this size. This is in service to the pixel peeping, but also kind of getting the quality in good shape before you run the other processes that will try to separate out light from dark and, and give you a little bit more detail. So it all just kind of is little things up front to pay dividends later. So after TGV, the next thing is moving on to kind of the a three pack of processes that I do to kind of help have the data, uh, have the, the details kind of stand out a little bit better. Uh, so this is this three pack 
starts with the HDR multi-scale transform and then two rounds of the local histogram. Let me close these other guys up. So the HDR multi-scale transform is the first one that I do. The idea there is to take any detail that may be hidden in really bright areas and let it start to come out a little bit more, right? So in this one, typically I'm running between six to eight as my number of layers and leaving everything else as is and just kind of seeing which one of those I, I like best. The, the layers is gonna deal with the size of the detail that it's looking across size and pixels. Um, now in this case, even though the object is very long on here, I still consider this a small galaxy because of how narrow across the actual bands of real detail are. So in this case, I think, let me actually open up yeah, I actually even ran this one at five at the end of the day, and five is normally very, very small scale for me. But doing that, if you notice, the glow just gets toned down here, and you've got a, a little bit of additional detail that comes out. And so it's kind of a uh, definitely just personal preference as you go through these on, on which way you like it better on that but you know for me I wanted to let some of these darker areas stand out just a little bit more so at the full out level very subtle it's really just in this kind of blob that most of that effect happens in and then I move into local histogram and with local histogram I normally run this at a small kernel radius of about 50 and then a larger one at about 150 so running those two, you know, once again, very subtle differences here. But you go to the first one, and it just defines out the contrast just a little bit better uh, in those. And then running the second one, it does it just a little bit more. So going to where it was before, that was everything before. And then after the three pack, hopefully you can tell it just kind of pops more. That's really that's really what we're looking at. It may even seem like it's sharper, but it, it really hasn't sharpened anything. It's just taken the light and dark areas that were already there and kind of changed their values to provide more definition to what's going on there. So after kind of the three pack there, most of the kind of manipulating the numbers uh, has been done. And the rest of this is just kind of kind of getting some things suited to taste and then getting the stars out of the way. Uh, so the next thing is, is the curves transformation. So typically on that, if you can tell here, I did a very gentle S curve, really just bringing the background down a little bit and even trying to keep the midtones actually about where they were while I did that. So that first curves, just darkened it up a little bit, right? So going from here to there, just darkening it up a little bit. And then I ran a second one, and, and a lot of times it's an iterative process. What I'm really working on here with that purple line is the saturation. So I really just kind of wanted to boost the saturation a little bit. So doing that, kind of oranges, reds it up just a little bit uh, by boosting the overall saturation. So kind of stepping back before all the curves to after, right? So just a little bit on color, a little bit on background and brightness. Then we get into morphological transformation. This is star reduction. So just trying to dim out the stars. The, the good news when you're zoomed in on a small galaxy, you typically don't have a lot of stars in your way, but, um, but a lot of times it can be helpful to do. The important thing on this one, you can see I'm starting to have some masks coming in here. So I ran the star mask process. So just star mask. These were the basic settings that I ran at to get a nice nice little star mask to, to start off here. And then, so this is the, the star mask that I had there. Applied it on the image and then inverted it. So, or I'm sorry, didn't invert it for the stars because uh, I want to only select the stars. I don't want to run this reduction on the galaxy overall. So running that, you're going to see 
it's a crazy subtle difference. So that's before and that's after. To show you kind of where this comes into play, let's look at these stars here. Even the big stars really aren't going to change much. It's really these here that you're going to see. So there's before and there's after. And so you can see they just kind of dim down a bit. Um, in this case, because of how egg-shaped my stars were, I actually ran this at four iterations instead of my normal two. But otherwise, normally I run it at two with exactly these settings with a mask to focus just on the stars uh, so that I don't hit any of my detail areas. And so now that the stars are dimmed, um, I'm going to run another multi-scale linear transform. This time, instead of doing it as noise reduction, doing it for sharpening. So instead of using these noise reduction ones, I'm playing with the bias levels. I normally have a very just set pack of numbers that I'm looking at per layer. And so what it's doing is it's emphasizing the smaller layer, then the next level up a little bit less, next level up at that level, and then the higher level up uh, even less than that to, to just kind of be smooth. But by emphasizing the smaller scale structures, in the way the image is, it's effectively defining them a little bit more. They're sharpening up a little bit without some of the noise artifacting that you tend to see um, with your standard like unsharp process. So it allows you to, to do a little bit more there, or be a little bit less aggressive when you do run an unsharp mask. Just kind of zooming in a bit here, running that one. Once again, very subtle. If you notice these edging areas, just pick up a little bit more definition. So that's without it and then with it. So very subtle, but it does help at that whole level of sharpening things up. Then running an unsharp mask. So the unsharp mask is the same basic process. If you notice, I have my star mask is still on, but what I've done is invert it. So now I'm hitting everything that isn't my stars. Uh, so hopefully I'm not chewing those up with sharpening. Um, these are the standard kind of unsharp settings that I run with here. And so running the unsharp mask did just a little bit. Once again, kind of zoom in all the way in here before the unsharp and after. Very, very subtle because I did a lot of this under the, the multi-scale. So before the multi-scale, that's what we were looking at. And then after the two kind of two step sharpening process, we're going there. So you can see some of these pop outs here. So from there, I'll normally run my SCNR. So SCNR is really just used to take out any remaining green bias cast that you have. Sometimes you'll have a lot, sometimes you'll have very little. Uh, this one, that, that photometric color calibration did generally a pretty good job. So I really just had a little bit left in the background. And so, you know, typically green average neutral at one is perfectly fine as, as the default. Run that and I could barely tell a difference, but when I was like super looking at it fine tooth it did it did take out a little bit of green cast so it's just a good process to run on any true color image um, and then just a couple of last ones to, to kind of get final cleanup on sometimes i'll run this exponential transformation process with these settings um, it can give things just a little bit of a brightness pop so kind of going without it to with it so you notice kind of everything pops up um, you know, it, it's it's not a catch-all benefit for everything, but I find that it, it tends to give it a pop without feeling like it got overly stretched. So sometimes that's just just what the image needed to get a little bit more out of it. And the last one was, and you can kind of do this with curves or histogram, but really I'm just trying to get my final black level in. So looking at this one, that's the black level I'm trying to go for, right? And so these are the, the settings that I'd use there. But as I mentioned, when I did my initial stretch, I kept the floor all the way down. So that that's the background we've been working with. Well, now it's time to kind of bring it in a little bit. And that's really what you start playing with here. After getting to a black level 
that seems good and you can definitely overdo it and you can see in this case i still haven't started clipping any pixels but you know i'm dimming my object the closer i go into it so what will happen then a lot of times is you'll say okay well you know maybe i'm dimming my object a little bit i'll just bring this in and that's where you start over stretching your background that's where i was running into problems with my image from last time is over stretching that background because i just wanted to get some definition on the target back then so just like i said at the beginning my goal this time was to not end up doing the same thing this time around i did not want to end up over stretching it when i feel like i had my data pretty good there to begin with so that's where when i was doing this kind of final setting on it this time you can tell i really didn't move this point much and i didn't go all the way up to the floor i'm okay with a little bit in the background still i just wanted to bring it up just a little bit to darken this background from where it was before right so just darkening it a little bit not really doing too much here for this part of it so after running that that's that's where i ended up with there and then i ran a very you know just a, a very final curve on this and so the final curve here i did really to show where i think you can go a little overboard so this is actually my final here but i ran one extra curve just for for this video right so this is after i've done that histogram part doing a curve to say okay well maybe let's bring is it worth bringing the background more down more and brightening up all of this uh, because i i know on my images i actually tend to like things a little dimmer than i see in some other images all just personal preference at this point right but in going to it yes i brightened up the core of what i had there but i feel like i lose some subtlety you know even though things got got darker i feel like my stars don't feel as natural when i go to that other jump and i feel like in here feels almost like it was like a little bit more punched out um, of the background as opposed to kind of part of the sky overall so my personal preference i left it in in a way that i felt a little bit more natural with it uh, so you know the lesson for me there is to to not overdo that final processing i think i had to overdo it on the last one between the crop and how faint it was you know how i wasn't really able to get everything i wanted to get out of it so i really had to stretch the crud out of it in order to make it come out looking right uh, but this time because I, I took a little bit more time on the exposure time uh, and that kind of thing i was able to to, to get away with a lot more um, so that took me to the final image and so comparing the two of these here at the end of the day i actually even went an extra step of registering the two of these together doing a quick star alignment process just so that i could see you know true apples to apples they're they're now at the same size uh you know the difference uh between when i took it last year and this year and and i think it's pretty strikingly obvious right but just zooming in on these here you know and this is even you know at a point where i'd say this image doesn't look super great uh you know zoomed in at two to one um but same image at two to one you can just see there's no there's no detail you know in this one it's just a stripe kind of going across on this one there's definitely a lot more detail in here so could the image be better sure every time we take an image it can be better right but especially at the one-to-one -one, you know between these two it's pretty night and day you know the background at one-to-one -one here just seems smooth like butter versus this one that just looks real bad uh you know the noise level you know on the edges here is you know much much improved the little attendant 
satellite galaxies here, even that little faint guy there, all look much better in here. Um, and then obviously the color is much better. It's not a whole bunch of blued out stars or something, uh, that kind of thing. This actually looks a ton more natural. Here. But So this is the final final of my needle galaxy for this year. And once again, still not perfect. I've got egg-shaped stars uh, in the mix here. You know, I think the detail would come out much, much sharper uh, if I got my, my collimation and spacing and everything just right. But especially over comparison to last year, much more improved for me. But uh, I hope this, this helps you guys on thinking about the steps that you can go through, uh, even if you just kind of want to copy what I did for uh, smaller galaxies that you may be taking pictures of. And you can still get a good picture at the end of the day there. You just need to, to really focus on some things like getting the detail good in here, watching out for your background, because if you're taking a picture of the North American Nebula and it takes up 90% of your image, your background isn't that important. But if you're taking a picture of this where, yeah, this is your focus, but this is only maybe 10% of my actual total image coming across here, the background starts becoming a much more critical piece of what you're doing, right? Having an, something that looks even and feels, feels nice without being plasticky uh, is really going to help make this look good too, uh, because it doesn't matter how good this looks if this all looks like a a printout from the 70s um yeah you know, it's it's just going to drag down the whole quality of everything so that's it for this time um i hope that's helpful to you guys uh, i wish you guys good luck uh, as we go through galaxy season here i hope everyone is is remaining safe um and until next time i wish everybody clear skies <laughs>